If the sirens ever go off, it's already too late to panic. You have less than 60 seconds to decide whether you live or vanish. This isn't fiction. It's the protocol that still exists in every major city on Earth. And if you ever hear that sound, what you do next will decide everything. There's no warning, no countdown, no dramatic flash across the sky. One second, the world hums with noise. The next, it's brighter than the sun. At that moment, survival isn't about courage. It's about knowledge. Because the first mistake people make is looking up. That light, that beautiful, terrifying light, burns hotter than the surface of the sun. It can cause temporary or permanent blindness in an instant. If you see the flash, your eyes are already burned. So don't look. Drop to the ground, face down. Cover your head and neck with your arms. If you're near anything sturdy, get under it. It's the old duck and cover technique, and it sounds primitive, but it's precisely what could shield you from the blast wave and the storm of flying debris that follows. It is exactly what could keep you alive in those first seconds. The blast lasts for seconds. The fallout lasts for decades. Within the first hour, the danger changes. It becomes silent, invisible. Radioactive dust, fallout, begins to drift down like a fine gray snow. It settles on everything, carrying particles that destroy you from the inside out. You have a very small window to move. Not far, but down. Underground is best. A basement. A subway tunnel. If you can't go down, go to the center. Find a building with thick concrete or brick walls and get to its core, as far from the windows and the roof as you can. Every foot of earth, Every inch of concrete is a layer of life. The deeper you go, the slower death moves. Forget running, forget getting in your car. A vehicle is a metal coffin. Its engine pulls in the contaminated air, and its thin walls offer almost no protection from the radiation. Your goal isn't escape, it's containment. Once you're in the most protected space you can find, you must seal it. Block the vents, the cracks under doors, the windows, Use anything you can find, duct tape, plastic sheeting, heavy blankets. Create a barrier between your lungs and the outside world. Every hour you spend inside increases your chance of survival. And then you wait for at least 24 to 72 hours. Radiation levels outside are at their most lethal during this period, but they decrease exponentially with time. If you were caught outside even for a moment, you must decontaminate. Carefully remove your outer layer of clothing and seal it in a bag as far from you as possible. If you can, shower with soap and warm water. Scrub your skin and hair, but do not use hair conditioner. It acts like a glue, binding radioactive particles directly to your hair. This is the new reality. Survival is not a single act, but a series of cold, calculated decisions. It's the knowledge of what to do when the world you knew has turned to ash, and the silence that follows is the most terrifying sound of all. It's quiet now, the kind of quiet that makes you hear your own pulse. In the immediate aftermath of a nuclear detonation, your first instinct will be to go outside, to see, to, to know. Don't. For the first 24 hours, the world is saturated with lethal radiation. The food, the water, the very air is poisoned. Your only job is to stay where you are, seal your environment, wait, and listen. The most effective shelter is dense and deep. The basement of a brick or concrete building is ideal, away from windows in the center of the structure. If you are outside during the blast, you must decontaminate. Remove your outer layer of clothing and wash your skin and hair with soap and water to remove the radioactive particles that cling to you like a ghost. Think of your body as a small reactor of its own. It needs warmth, hydration, calm. Drink only what was sealed before the blast. Canned goods, bottled water. If you have no water, clean ice can be melted. But never touch the rain, never touch the ash. Survival here isn't about high-tech gadgets or elaborate bunkers. It's about patience and control. Radiation levels decay exponentially. 
After about seven hours, they fall to just 10% of their initial intensity. After 48 hours, they drop to 1%. Time is your shield. And when you finally step outside, the world will look the same, but fundamentally wrong. No birdsong, no sound of wind in the trees, only a blanket of dust over ruins. This is when the hardest part begins. Not the struggle for survival, but the struggle for meaning. Surviving an event of this magnitude inflicts a profound psychological toll. Post-traumatic stress, anxiety, deep-seated grief. Studies of past disasters show these symptoms can persist for years. What happens after you've lived through the end? Who do you become when everything that defined your world has burned away? The answer is found not in isolation, but in connection. Re-establishing routines, rebuilding communities, staying connected to other survivors, these are the anchors in a world unmoored, limiting exposure to constant reminders of the trauma while finding purpose in the act of rebuilding becomes a new form of survival. For most, the world will never return to what it was, but for those who remain, a new kind of civilization begins, one built not on comfort but on memory and resilience. This new world is forged through conscious effort. It requires a plan. Communities must ensure access to clean resources. Food must come from sealed containers, wiped clean before opening. Water from bottled sources or protected wells, but never from open rivers or lakes. Public education becomes paramount, with communities running drills and sharing knowledge on how to navigate this new reality. And our infrastructure itself must adapt. Architects are already designing subterranean shelters with green roofs that can serve as public spaces in times of peace, or reinforce structures made of high-density concrete that can withstand not just a blast, but its radioactive aftermath. It's a civilization defined by its shared knowledge of fragility. Ultimately, surviving a nuclear war isn't about luck. It's about knowing. Knowing how to protect yourself. Knowing how radiation behaves. Knowing how fragile our world really is. And it's about understanding how powerful one single human instinct can be. The instinct to simply keep going. To find a reason to take the next breath. To take the next step. Maybe the real test isn't surviving the blast, but surviving what comes after it.